trying to um, figure out how that's actually going to shape and, and actually have form. You have to glance at that at some point and see, um, you know, if there's aspects of that that you think you'd like to see emphasized more. More importantly, if there's a great big gaping hole that you're like, oh, I think we really need to hear more about that. Please let us know, and we will um, endeavor to uh, pass it. The other thing that's in here is this is um, just some learning collaborative team notes. Um, uh, and we'll go over those a little bit more when we do the breakout sessions. Um, but these are just some additional resources and things to complement what you're going to uh, work on today with Mary. So, uh, and then the other thing that's in here is a copy of um, all Mary Forms here, and then her. Uh, for tools that she's using for the rest of the time. So I just want to introduce Mary. She's brand new to Edmonton. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> we still went from Toronto. Yay! Yeah. Um, I'm ready to ice walk. <laughs> Mary was at an occupational therapy clinic for 20 years. Uh, most, mostly in the therapy setting. Uh, working a lot with um, clients who uh, have you know, significant issues with obesity and yep. need for accommodation. Um, so that's like your passion. It is. And she did um, grad school. Went back into grad school and did a PhD in midlife like crisis. <laughs> yeah. So she'll tell more about it herself. But she was here two months ago. Well, two months ago. Four months yeah. ago. And I'm really excited that you have her. It's nice. Thanks for having me. Um, so, as Denise said, I'm a, an occupational therapist by training, and a and a recent uh, sort. Of, I call myself a new researcher, learning about research. Um, and what I'm going to focus on today is weight bias and how that um, impacts our clinical care and our work with with clients. Um, I will flip between talking to some patients and clients. I mean the same thing, um, same level of respect, regardless what language I use. Um, what we're going to do to start off with is um, you should have been given two questionnaires when you came in. One's called the ATOP and one's called the BAOP. Um, I want to say first off, before these questionnaires can be a little intimidating, these are for your own use only. We have not collected this information. You don't even have to it. You can take it with you, you can shred it, you can do whatever you want with it afterwards. This is really for more of a self-reflection exercise. I'm not going to ask anyone to show the results, but it gives me a talking point. It gives you an idea of some of the questions and concerns and things that we have. I'm not coming in with any preconceived ideas about what your values and beliefs are about people living with obesity. Um, I did these questionnaires, uh, I've done them a few times, and I've been a least biased person working with patients with obesity. I didn't think I really had any, but I did. I was really surprised by that. So it's an important exercise for us through just to reflect and, and, and bring up some issues. But again, I re please be reassured that this is not about you. This is about the topic. Okay? Um, of course, you have the right not to do them. That's completely up to you. They're not part of the study here. I, I should clarify that. And of this information, um, I'm not even collecting it, that we're going to talk about today is part of the research study. Um, work through. Don't overanalyze your answer. Just go with your first gut response, okay? And there's no good or bad. This is not a pass or fail type of questionnaire. It's just more of a reflection. Don't try to score because there's a bit of a tricky scoring system. I'll go through it with you. So the learning objectives of today's session are to rec recognize antecedents to weight bias in clinical settings. So we're going to talk a little bit about the causes and consequences of weight bias uh, in clinical settings such as primary care. Uh, to become more aware of your own attitudes toward and beliefs about persons with obesity. That's the questionnaire that you just did that we'll go through. Uh, to learn about the impact of weight bias on engagement in primary health. So how does that weight bias that patients experience or that we may create in our care environments actually interfere with the um, practitioner-patient relationship or that patient's uh, feeling of belonging and engagement in, in their own health care? 
and to be able to identify and apply strategies to reduce weight bias in primary health care settings. So hopefully today you'll leave with some strategies um, that you can make some small, probably very minor changes, but can have a big impact on patient care. So we already did this. For those of you who came in a little bit later, don't worry about feeling like you're behind. We can just work through things. Um, so what we're going to do is, oh, and, and there's quite a little reacclimation. This information is not part of this. Okay? My presentation is, but your feedback on the questionnaire is not. So here's the scoring. So for the A talk, which is the longer one, don't be intimidated. It's not. It's just adding. Each question is worth a different value. So what you want to do for step one is multiply the response to the following item by minus one. Okay, so you're just reversing the order of the scoring. It's negative, it becomes positive. If it's a positive, it becomes a negative. Um, so if it's two through six, multiply those by negative one, whatever your score was. Does it are you okay with that? No. Okay. So for item two, let's say you got minus two. You're going to multiply it by minus one, so it's going to be a positive two. So the positive becomes a negative. So item one, leave it as it is. Okay. Item 13, leave it as it is. Item 17 and 18, leave it as they are. Okay. The other ones, you're reversing the score. And then add the responses up based on your converted scores, the converted numbers. So add them all up. And then you add 60 to your total. If you have a copy of the slides, this is on your slides too, if you prefer to have it in front of you. If you came a few minutes late, don't worry, we can catch up because it's on your slides. You can catch up adding it. So for the BAOP, this is the one that has the eight items. Okay, what you're going to do is the same thing. You're going to multiply items 1 by negative 1. So if it's a negative, it becomes a positive. If it's a positive, it becomes a negative. Then items 3, 4, 5, and 6, you're going to do the same thing. Multiply whatever you got by minus 1. So you're just reversing positive and negative. And then also item 8, you're doing that. Look at how efficient you are now. See, you're probably good. Then just add up your new your new scores. Add them up. And then add 24 to the total. Okay, so what do these scores actually mean? We'll come back to that. Okay. Actually, let's let's um let's go through this. I thought I included the slide, but I didn't. So what what the actual scores mean is so if you're adding up the beliefs about um, obesity let's do that one first the short one so if you have a higher score um a higher score on the beliefs about obesity it means that you have a stronger belief that obesity is outside of the control of the individual that, that, that there's a strong external locus of control for the individual that's resulting in the state of obesity. Okay, A lower score on the beliefs about obesity means that you feel that person has more control, that they're more solely responsible for the state of obesity. And that will make sense later when we talk about where we believe, what we believe causes obesity. And it's not that having a low score or a high score is bad or good. It's just what you believe. And a lot of those beliefs come from our education, our knowledge about the causes of obesity, our perspective of obesity. Do we look at obesity as a chronic health condition? Do we look at obesity as a result of moral failure? There's all kinds of reasons that contribute to our beliefs that we're going to talk about today. So it's not that it's bad or good. It's just what it is. Okay. This one goes up to 48. Okay, so a higher, the closer you are to 48, the less control you believe the person has over obesity. And it's, it's external to themselves. And a lower score could be one. Very few people ever get that. But then that would mean that you believe that the person is solely responsible 
in custody. And they, this kind of a test is not that sensitive, so I can't say the range. This means this, this means that, but the highest is 48. Does that help? Sorry, that would be helpful. When I do this with health professionals, I've actually done this with health professionals in a few situations with dietitians, and occupational therapists, and, and physicians. Um, the scores tend to hover around the high 20s. Okay, so is there a middle of the road? There's some, you know, yeah, it's the responsibility of the person, but yes, there might be some other things going on. Um, and grad students, the same thing, health uh, students that are in health science types of programs or allied health training programs, around the same thing. Yeah, so it's, it's not bad, actually. And then for the um, ATOG, this one goes up to, I believe, 120 is the maximum score. Your, if the higher the score means you have a more positive attitude toward individuals with obesity, meaning that you don't carry a lot of the stereotypes or generalizations that are attributed to people with obesity. A lower score uh, is more negative attitude. But again, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It could be your it could be the education that you've had, the environment you grew up in, the group that you have trained with. Um, your own you know, family experience, um, the exposure that you have externally to sort of your work life. So we all bring sort of a story or a history with us that contribute to our attitudes and also our beliefs. And the distinguishing feature between attitudes and beliefs is attitudes are sort of our, our, our the value we attribute to so our attitude towards persons living with obesity is the value that we attribute to that person in terms of their capabilities, their contributions, their abilities, which as a healthcare professional is really, really important. And your beliefs about obesity are your sort of your understanding about what obesity is and what causes it and what are some of the consequences. And going through the five A's, we'll learn more and more about that. So your scores on the ATOP and the BAFP may actually change over the course of your exposure to, to this course or the, or the modules that you're going through. I don't think we have a plan to retest because we're not collecting scores. But if you're at all interested in your own personal change, I could certainly make, you could do this again if you wanted for your own use. Okay. Thank you for indulging me on that, and this is really for you to reflect on through the, the rest of the talk. So if you were surprised at all by your results, um, you know, think about ways that maybe you can alter some of those beliefs or some of those attitudes. And um, from a research perspective, we know that some of the most effective ways of making those changes is through education, so learning more. Uh, about obesity, but also exposure to individuals living with obesity and really listening and hearing their stories about resilience and persistence, and that actually changes our beliefs and attitudes. And that's how mine changed. The more people I met, the more patients I worked with, the more surprising surprises that came my way about their ability and their resilience, and, and there was a real growth of respect and admiration. Okay, so what is weight bias? So weight bias is the beliefs about a person's values, their skills, their abilities, and their personality based on their body weight. And as a society, we have been culturized or socialized to view and make um, decisions about people's ability based on their We do that unfortunately, with a lot of different characteristics. Body weight is one of them. Um, in fact, most re research that's come out of the Yale Red Center for um, Obesity and Food Policy at um, Yale University is that obesity or weight is actually one of the leading biases in our society right now um, that is on par with racism and um, bias towards people based on their uh, sexual orientation. So it's up there, it's really high, and it's impacting a lot of people. Stigma is a result of weight. So stigma um, comes across as the disapproval or discontent with a person or a group based on the perceptions and stereotypes. 
So when there's certain values and beliefs attributed to a group of patients, such as those with obesity, they become marginalized and stigmatized, and they are treated differently. So where did weight bias come from? The sources of bias come from physicians, dietitians, nurses, psychologists, medical students, psychologists, occupational therapists, pretty much any medical profession has weight bias. There's no group that has risen above that. Uh, the environments in which patients with obesity are experiencing uh, weight bias is in primary health care, tertiary care settings, like a rehab and inpatient <laughs> rehab setting, acute care, long-term care, home care, and community care. There's no way they're not getting it. And the consequences, patients feel disrespected, the parents of children with obesity feel blamed, and there's avoidance of health care. So we're not feeling comfortable in the environment, or we're not feeling respected or listened to or heard, we don't go back. We avoid it, which in a primary care environment is really dangerous because people aren't even into coming in for preventative screening. We're going to talk a bit about that. So weight bias from health professionals. Is anyone here surprised that there's weight bias amongst health professionals? Have you all heard comments or experience that in settings? I know I have. I'm, you know, I, I worked a lot in, um, in tertiary care, so gathering around the nursing units and talking about patients in rounds. And the comments that I would hear about patients with obesity were unbelievable. And then you stop being shocked by it. And then it becomes almost accepted behind closed doors to some degree. And that's not okay. And I'm sure you've all had stories that you can share, which I won't ask you to, about your own experiences and things that you hear. They can be very, very subtle, or they can be very, very explicit. So this is all based on research. This isn't just me pulling this out of the air. Uh, so with physicians, evidence shows that physicians, including physicians who work with patients with obesity and considered obesity experts, uh, few patients with obesity, this is like general consensus of research, answering questionnaires, much like the one you did, as being lazy, non-compliant, lacking in uh, self-control, having no willpower, being unintelligent, dishonest, and unsuccessful compared to patients who don't have obesity. Imagine being a patient and working with a health professional who has these preconceived ideas about you based on your weight. It's going to have an impact on the care. And this was some research done in 2003 and 2001. This doesn't mean all physicians are biased. I'm sure the news is not that way at all for patients. But I imagine, think about your experience, you probably have come across this. Uh, patient experiences with physicians based on weight bias. So in the study of over 2,000 women with obesity, 52% of those women reported stigmatized by doctors more, more than one occasion. So it wasn't a one-off. And it was by the same person over and over and over again. Patients reported feeling berated and disrespected. And patients with obesity reported feeling blamed and disconnected. The parents are there for one reason pulled aside, or even told in front of the child, what are you feeding this kid? Wow, this kid's really bulking up. Just a very simple comment where a, pa a patient or a mom or dad is feeling blamed. You need to leave here today at all feeling afraid to ask those questions. And what you're going to learn through the five days is how to raise these topics um, with the least amount of angst as possible. There's always going to be maybe a reaction, but as professionals, we, we deal with those reactions frequently for whatever topic. We raise sensitive topics with our patients all the time. Weight seems to be one of those ones that we all get a little uncomfortable about. It's interesting. I can imagine the intimate conversations you've had with patients about a number of topics that are no problem. But when it comes to obesity, something stops us. And, and people have a response to that. And so what you have to remember, too, is that that patient whether it be the patient with the knee or the mom with the, the baby, is that they're bringing in a history with them. 
And it may not be what you said or how you said it to them, but it has been the tipping point from everything else that they brought. So they may have had a comment on the bus. Somebody may have said something to them in the office the day before, and you were the last person, and it wasn't what you said, it was the timing of it. So we have to remember, too, the history that people are bringing with us. So by all means, yes, we have to raise the topics. It's really important. It's how we do it. Um, and again, we don't know the context of what, how these women were responding. That is important. But the fact that people are leaving their physician's office feeling this way is an issue. And it's something that we have to be aware of. And you may be the third person that this person has maybe shopped around to find the best for them because of the way they've been treated. And it may be that little comment to go, oh, here we go again. So we persist. Do it gently. You have to be still do that for sure. Does that sort of immunization, when we go for an immunization, we're not prepared for those conversations. And you'll learn how to raise the topic of um, discussing with your patients through through this program and through the 5A uh, T's, which is a great, you're, you're the first read, I can tell you that with that. So it, it will help um, improve this comfort and your comfort level. And when we're more comfortable raising those topics, our patients pick up on that. And there's this sort of, oh, okay, we can do this because the intent is very clear on why we're doing it. It's not about judgment or value. But I would be offended too if I went in for a flu shot and suddenly somebody said, wow, well, you're you know, your hair's getting a little gray. Have you ever thought about dying on it? Uh, that's not why I'm here, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, maybe not the best example, but just to, to give you an idea. Okay? So, see, I mean, we've all experienced this. These are important conversations to have with our patients, but it's, again, it's, the, it's how the patients are perceiving them. We need to be aware of that. Be mindful of what the response is when we're raising a topic, um, and be prepared to rephrase or, or clarify what we mean um, but not get ourselves defensive when somebody reacts in a way we weren't anticipating. Okay, we, have to, we have to be mindful, as we do with anything. Um, so here's a testimonial that came out of, um, actually, one of the studies that I'm uh, currently working on. So uh, it says, my GP and MD staff have been the most demeaning toward me, complaining they have to change blood pressure cuffs and difficulty getting blood and other samples not pursuing a course of treatment because I am overweight. Seeing weight gain as an end result rather than a symptom of an underlying issue. Faced with disbelief when asked for calorie intake and amount of exercise. So this is a loaded state. This came out of a general question in one of the studies that, I've done that just said, um, tell me what it's like to be a patient in a primary care environment. Um, for, with as being a patient with obesity, and this was one of the responses that we got. So this person is is going in for maybe a routine exam or following up because they've got underlying complaints. Perhaps it's pain. I don't know what the health issue was with this particular patient, and right away feeling as if they're not welcomed, as if they don't belong, as if they don't fit with you know a doctor or a nurse or whoever it may be and I've, I've done this myself as an ot i worked in a in an endocrinologist's office and i would go in and i would do blood pressures um the reason i did blood pressures was because i was the only one who get con consistent readings because i was the oldest person in the office i don't know what that was about but <laughs> i was the ugly practitioner so i got really good blood blood uh, pressure readings in the office so i did all these blood pressure readings and when i first started doing it i was i was stressed about it. it's not a skill that ot's usually do it's not something we usually do and i would go in and i'd be you know trying to do it and i would go to put that cuff down and go doesn't fit. What an awkward moment it is. Let me be in that situation. Think. I didn't even think. And now I've got to get in this gracefully and not make the patient feel embarrassed. This particular person felt that they were a bother because the, the physician may have gone, oh, great. Now I've got to go and find an extra large cuff. Or, wow, it's really tough getting blood out of your arm. Whatever it may be that's going on. It's also here that the physician didn't believe what the patient was telling them, and they wanted written proof. And she wasn't in there for weight management. She was in there for some other underlying issue. And when he started asking her about what she was eating, it's like he didn't believe her, asking her specific details. 
So we have to be really careful. This person is really angry. When I see um, people responding with capitals and underlining and stuff, you know they mean it. So bias for dietitians. Are there any dietitians in the room? You guys are not immune to bias either. Not you, but as a profession. So registered dietitians and students reported beliefs about persons with obesity as not expecting them to adhere to, adhere to recommendations. And that really is demoralizing for the clinician, but also for the patients. Why am I even going to bother trying to go through all this? Because I know they're not going to follow it anyways. So you can actually withhold important treatment or information based on a bias. That they lack self-control, that they're unattractive, and that they always overeat. So some similar overlapping um, preconceived ideas about the patient as the physicians. Psychologists, do we have psychologists here? No? Okay, so we can talk about psychologists. So they also have bias. Evan just shows that um, the psychologists actually attribute more um, pathology, so uh, psychosocial or psychological pathology towards patients with obesity without any evidence that there is any existing pathology there. More severe psychological symptoms, that they have more uh, negative attributes, and worse psychological prognosis compared to patients without obesity. And again, if the health professional, you're going in with these preconceived ideas, how hard are you going to be working for this patient? Medical students. Any, do you have medical students here? Not right now. Okay. Sometimes they come in with bias. We're really trying hard in the programs for medical students, for allied health professionals to try to, to um, curb some of the bias before they get here. Um, medical students perceive patients with obesity as having, again, poor self-control, less likely to adhere, that they're sloppy or awkward, that they're unpleasant and unsuccessful. So what happens now? If this is what patients are experiencing, and maybe they've experienced it and they've come to expect it. I'm always saddened when a patient is overly surprised that you've done a good job for them. That's always disheartening to me when a patient goes, that was so good. I'm so relieved. That was really a great session. It was really nice to come here and meet everybody. Everyone here really knows what they're doing. That should be their experience everywhere. It shouldn't be a novelty. So what happens with weight bias on care? The relationship between the practitioner and the patient, it decreases the expectations of the patient. They come in expecting the worst and then are relieved when that doesn't happen. That's not good. Increased aggressiveness toward the patient. So we get frustrated if we carry this bias. We become impatient and we may not spend the time that we really should with them. We may neglect to explore all causes of health concerns. So there's a quote here from another study that I did in primary care. The doctor should look at my life a bit more. Just tell me, you know, you shouldn't be eating so much. This person was going through some pretty serious complaints, and they were really worried. There had been diabetes in the family, there had been some cancer in the family. They were really quite concerned about their health. But all that kept coming up, let's talk about your weight, but I want to look at this. Well, there's no point in us looking at this until we start addressing your weight. The person wasn't having any need. And there's a, a, quite a sad story that we hear too many times, actually. So I've had two separate um, participants in some of my research studies share the same story with me, two completely different people from different areas, that they had gone in complaining of pain in their pelvic region, gone in over and over and over again to their, their health team, saying pain. And all that they were told was, you have a lot of pain because you're significantly overweight and you need to reduce your weight and you won't have as much pain. That was the extent. They might have done some work. Nothing else was done. Both of these patients have been walking around on a fractured hip for seven months before someone took notice and actually took an x-ray. So they weren't fully explored. The pain is just completely attributed to obesity. And that is where our weight bias could be really play some really dangerous role if we don't explore fully because we feel everything attributed to the obesity, and it may not be. The person didn't break their hip because they had obesity. Um, the lack of respect for autonomy and individual differences. So this one-size-fits-all approach. So if we generalize that all patients with obesity um, need the same thing or have the same characteristics, we're not going to individualize 
care. And length of time spent with the patient, sorry, that should be spent. Uh, discomfort spending time with a patient who has obesity. You can see this. You can see when somebody may be really uncomfortable about being in the same room. We see this with patients who have an acute uh, psychiatric illness that are coming in. People are just really awkward around that. A lack of confidence working with patients with obesity. And this was another quote from a patient. I don't think the medical profession knows what to do or uh, have done enough to help people with their weight. So what also happens with the impact of weight bias on patient behavior is that sometimes if we don't address obesity, so if we don't raise the issue, which is really important to raise sometimes, is that patients will think, well, if they're not talking about it, why should I be worried about it? So this goes back to the point earlier where we have to raise the issue sometimes. Absolutely we do. So this patient saying, I'm looking at myself and thinking this can't be right. Why are the red flags not going up in their head? I guess if he or she is not worried about it, my obesity, why should I be worried about it? So it becomes untalked about. Not returning or delaying care. It's all about finding that trusting doctor. If you don't trust whom you're talking to or you don't feel like they're listening, then you don't want to come. And you won't come back. So the adherence rate patients to follow through with recommendations or to come back for regular follow-up is very low. Uh, so they avoid primary care and unrealistic weight loss expectations as well has come up. Um, that patients come in with unrealistic expectations as well because of the media and, you know, unfortunately, public health messages that weight loss is pretty simple. Eat less, move more, and lose. So patients come in with unrealistic expectations. I want to lose 50 pounds by Christmas, right? <laughs> you may hear that. So reasons patients avoid care, they're embarrassed about being weighed, they've experienced disrespect from members of the healthcare team, the medical equipment that they're having used on them is too small and they feel uncomfortable, embarrassed, um, unsolicited weight loss advice. No one likes to hear, well, oh, we have a larger cuff that we'll use to take your blood pressure today. That can be awkward, particularly if they say, oh, just a minute, I need to go get the larger cuff. Just have the larger cuff already in the room. Have it ready, have it ready. We've been expecting you. Welcome. It's not all oh, for an inconvenience. I've heard nurses in the hospital yell down, oh, who's got the extra cuff? I need it in room forever. It's humiliating. Hearing from a doctor that they understand what it's like to have obesity is useless. <laughs> Saying you understand when you don't is a lie. You don't understand, you can't understand because you've never gone through it. It's strange how words can have such an impact. And this is true for any health condition. If we try to overemphasize with our patients, in some situations, perhaps we can. So the first few times that this patient had their weight taken, they were a little taken aback because the scale was in the hall. Even though it was in, not in public area, it was in treatment area, it was still in a busy space. And they felt quite embarrassed by the fact that they had to step on a scale in a busy area um, where you know, they were concerned that people could hear about the weight, see their weight, and they didn't feel it was very private. So the cycle of weight bias and obesity is that, so if we start here, this is from the Yale Red Center as well. Rebecca Cole is a prolific researcher in this area. She's fantastic. So bias in healthcare leads to negative feelings. Negative feelings on the part of the health professionals, but also negative feelings from the patient. They avoid health care, or we may withhold health care. Not intentionally, but we may not fully offer the resources if we feel they're not going to help anyway, so the person is not going to follow through. Leads to unhealthy behaviors for ourselves, but also for our patients. It leads to increased obesity if people aren't getting the care that they need. Then there's health consequences associated with that. A higher demand on the health care system for issues that could have been prevented and it just continues. So we have to try to break that cycle. So here's some strategies. Ask permission to talk about weight. And that's the first step in the five A's is the ask piece. Is it okay if we talk about your weight today? You may have other strategies on how you want to approach this and you'll practice different methods. And the patient, you know your patients. 
you'll get to know what works for some people and what doesn't. Some patients are just straight ahead, blunt, give it to me straight, and I'm with that. Others need a softer, gentler. You'll figure that out. You'll know your pain. Ask the patient what their perspectives of their body weight are rather than assume they want to lose weight. Okay, so we don't want to assume that everybody who comes in with obesity wants to lose the weight. I was never so surprised as when we had a weight management clinic. A patient had been referred, and we were talking about her weight. And after the conversation, they realized she didn't want to lose weight, and she didn't need to lose weight. She was doing everything she wanted to do. Her health was fantastic. Um, she was running marathons. It blew me away. I couldn't believe it. I believed it. It was, it was a surprise to me. And I thought, why are you here? Um, anticipate that patients with obesity will come to see you. Don't react once they are already in your office. So what that means is you're going to have probably on average 30% of your 30%. It's a good chance that about 20% of those are going to have severe obesity. So the body mass is 40 or more. And that's when things start to get tricky in the exam room where you need the equipment that's a bit larger. Know you're going to have those patients, so make sure the environment is ready and waiting for them. And where possible, if you know ahead of time that patients can you make that extra effort to make sure that there's space, the chairs available, the right side gowns in the room, all of those things. Be mindful of the ne negative experiences that the patient with the brings with them before they've met you. They carry a whole history with them that you don't even know about, that may have nothing to do with you, but you may say that one thing that triggers them. So recognize that the day-to-day -day interactions of individuals living with, particularly with severe obesity, is a challenge every time you go to do something. Um, place a scale in a private area where possible. And weigh the patient during the visit, not wait at the office. It's so, we're so busy, and it's so easy to say, okay, on the way in, pop up on the scale, we'll get your weight, we write it down in charge or, or electronically, if that's how you do it, and into the exam room they go, pop up on the table, get undressed, the doctor will be in a minute. But the person's like, what happened? And maybe that come on the scale is a real shock to them, and you've left them sitting with all of that. No matter what else happens, the, the visit has started up negatively. Sometimes, practically, you have to do it in that order, but when you don't have to, Maybe talk about issues first and not make weight your primary issue. Refrain from sharing your own weight loss stories or anecdotal tips. Patients will ask you, oh, how do you stay so fit? You don't need to share your own story. It's about providing the evidence and, and consistency with what you do here. And then prior to posting anything in the office, check the content, the words and the images that are on the, the, um, the poster or the flyer. Um, check it with others around you to make sure that it's not creating a statement. What does the image say? What does the image look like? Is it uh, an image of obesity where there's no head and no lower? You know, how we just see sort of stomach sitting on a chair? Those are, are biased and stigmatizing images. So the Canadian Obesity Network, and it's on the list of reasons, an image gallery that's free. And it's showing individuals with obesity doing everyday regular things in a very respectful way. You can use those images on advertising or posters or different presentations. And focus on outcomes of health and wellness. You probably still achieve the same goals and you'll do it in a way that makes that person feel really respected. So here's a whole bunch of references. And some resources. So the obesitynetwork.ca is where you can get the image gallery. Um, I think there's 60 images. And the Yale Red Center also has an image gallery. And it's free for use as well. And there's also a ton of resources on both of the sites around weight bias. There's links to videos, documentaries, all kinds of things that we wouldn't have had the time to, to share with you today. But if you're at all interested, there's some really great stuff that runs between 15 minutes to a half an hour. Okay, and then the Canadian Obesity uh, Network actually did a whole segment two years ago, weight bias and stigma, and it's a hot topic, it's an important topic, and the Obesity Network, which is partnered with the five A's, is um, really pushing forward. Yes, do we open it up to questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, we've been saying that, so thanks for that. You're welcome. Um, take a few minutes, what are the reasons why... Uh... That's okay.
It is tough. But if you, so imagine that conversation happening in the back room. You, you already have the patient in your office or the room with you. What you can need to do to help diffuse some of that angst that may be coming in the door with that patient is the waiting room. If, if right away they come into the waiting room and they say, it's a chair for me. There's a, there's a place that I can sit comfortably and not feel embarrassed or uncomfortable. Right away is, hey, this may not actually be so bad. It might not be that expensive, but it's that feeling. And when they come in to check in, I don't know what the process is here, but maybe they, they are met at reception. Hi, who are you here to see today? And sometimes even at that point, there can be a look or something that sets the person off. So it's even a step of the way. If a patient calls ahead to make an appointment, and one of the comments from the studies I did was that the patient, even at the point of phoning in to make an appointment, was, well, what's the reason for your visit? And they need to know that to book the right amount of time to code it properly for billing. And if a patient feels that they want to talk about their weight, there needs to be a way to say that without feeling judged. So it's all the build up to the time that they even get into your office. And then if they get into the office and they need to undress for whatever the, the process might be for their visit, if there's a gown there that fits, it'll be, okay, these people are on the ball here. I feel comfortable and welcome here. It may actually make raise the conversation that much easier because there's already been a level of respect and anticipation shown to that patient. It may not. It's not going to be 100% foolproof for sure. And you're going to learn through this phase how to raise the topic and how to ask it about obesity in a way that's going to have sort of the most success. Yeah. So I hope you don't leave today feeling overly worried about what you say and what you don't say. It's really about it is common sense when you start to think about it. The chair, having the equipment, the language that you use. Um, there's one thing that I've been saying over and over again. I don't know if anyone's picked up on it, but I don't use the word obese patient. It's person living with obesity. So it's using that person first language. And when I'm talking with patients, I'll usually say, um, I'd like to talk to you about what it's like living with obesity. Not, I want to talk about your obesity. So already, I've removed the obesity as a label and maybe as a value judgment. So just even separating that, sometimes you can see the, the shoulder go down and the, okay, let's talk about that. We're talking about an entity or medical condition, not about you as a person. You may decide and talk about this maybe as a, in your group about, you know, can we talk about um, the body weight today or can we talk about... Um, the number that we saw on the scale over there, or can we talk about what it's like for you? Um, you know, does does your body weight at all impact your day? You can start to do it that way. I asked patients in one of my studies who, who have severe obesity. I said, "What do we do? do we say obesity? Do we say weight? Do we say body size?" And the consistent message I got out of 25 patients, a lot of people, was, "I know I have obesity." Call it what it is. And if I'm in a medical environment, obesity is now recognized as a medical condition, then that's what we're talking about. We don't say, oh, so can we talk about the blood sugars that seem to be a little high? No, we say diabetes. Okay, well, thank you for your time and um, patience with math challenges this morning. <laughs> so.